Okay, in this section, what I want to come across is managing uh, both the construction and facilities uh, that are done inside a GIS. And a good way to look at it is to go through this gas concept, well drilling, completion, and production equipment. So we start with the drilling process of looking at the data and information that could be gathered to GIS to the facilities that are left behind on a site. So you're looking at an area up here in Wyoming. Uh, it's called the Jonah Field uh, Pinedale Anticline Development. Uh, is 2012. Uh, going through that area, just looking at where it's at. Large number of wells that were put into place, and so you can see uh, not only here in the Jonah area, but even in the surrounding areas, the amount of wells and facilities that were put into place. So that were 700 miles, mainly federal wells that went on BLM uh, locations. So in the BLM, following the gold book, there's a lot of processes that you have to go through. And I'll, I'll talk about the BLM uh, gold book in a later section. But out of the 4,400 wells, there are about 600 pads that were designed uh, with an average of 7.3 pads per well and 40 acres of downhole well spacing. So you can look at the overlays of the BLM uh, lands to where these wells are at. Now looking at the types of drilling that was going on. So we have these wells that were mainly vertical wells, but there was some uh, directional uh, deviated vertical wells where there was a going down, but they, they drilled uh, over. Uh, maybe the surface location wasn't ideal to drill straight down so they had to do some deviation uh, to get to those locations. Two actual horizontal wells where they drilled down and had long areas where they might have fracked into that area. So you had a lot of different pads and ponds and pods uh, that were set up with these areas. So you, you had a lot of pads and areas that took up a lot of acreage. You know, some were 10 acres, 20 acres, individual ones, single wells, typically 10 acres. There could be some individuals that got up to 40 acres. Sometimes they were as small as five acres uh, that had all the facilities and uh, pipelines and ponds and things of that nature. So here's just looking at the construction of new pads. So out there moving the earth and trying to redesign it to best fit all the facilities on there. And that's what we're going to do in our lab this semester, this uh, module. <clears throat> you can see some existing wells here in the background. Here's a new rig uh, that's in this area. So if you think about it, we had these wells uh, that were potentially could be one, two, three, four type wells. They're drilling in lots of different directions, uh, but not too far away is another pad. So they had, especially in, in some of the Colbane methane uh, areas, you'll have multiple drill locations, if you will, going into those areas. Here you can see some existing wells and new ones that are there. So they're very tight and clustered in that area. And they'll come back and even add them to existing pads or, or not go very far over and, and get other uh, areas. So here you can see a drill rig uh, that's going up. One of the things that's uh, of concern in the GIS as you place this rig is that you have a radius around this rig. You know, are there any power lines, any other existing wells uh, production equipment that's that's in operation while you're trying to drill on those is important to know because we have lay down or fall down uh, radiuses that we have to be concerned with and uh, potential other wells that's in the area so we need to know about that and if we design that we can instantly put it there put in a radius for the height of the rig so we know information about this rig so we have like the rig itself the control room uh, which way does it spud? Uh, which way will it be heading? And when it uh, drills down to a area, do we, we put a cage over that area as we move further and further away? Uh, which way is it pushing the cuttings as it goes out? Where are the diesel generators that are powering that rig? Where do they sit uh, uh, near that location and, and powering that unit? That becomes an interest to us. Uh, their storage tanks and information for the gases and fuels. Uh, we need to know where those are located. 
Uh, then we have the, the drill mud pumps that are pumping the mud for drilling. Where are those at? Where are the drill mud tanks? Where are they mixing the mud, you know? And then when we have mixing of chemicals that may be going into the downhole mud uh, for lubrication uh, or even for casing in the, the well, uh, we need to know where those sit on the facility as we do it and we can keep that as a template in our design element and move that from rig to rig uh, location and move that around. And this kind of information for the construction stuff, here's a drill mud return pipe. Here you can see where the cuttings are going into a separator. They have shake separators separating sort of the bigger particulates to the chemicals. And we have some slurry in here. And this is called a, a closed loop system. They're putting the cuttings over here. And these cuttings with the little bobcat there are actually could be either buried or hauled away. In a closed loop system, they typically will put them in an area uh, that they hold temporarily and then dump them maybe into a, uh, a trucking area that might be uh, shipped off so you can see where that's at and then here we might have over here some lined ponds where we have water storage that we need so we'll fill this with water and use that as a storage location. and then we might be using these pumps if you will to uh, pump the water into that area so here you can see several large ponds that are lined uh, that hold the water. Here's a blowout prevention uh, valve. You know, this information about this, serial numbers, age, when it was last serviced, all that information could be in a facility database somewhere that could be tied to the GP GIS. Where was this blowout prevention used when it was the last service? Where all wells it could, it was it used at last? Uh, those informations are kept in somewhat separate database, but they do have some geospatial ties that we could use from it. Drilling flare box with spark condition, so we have some protections from flares. Here's some of our well casings, uh, the pipe that we're going to be pushing down into the ground uh, that might be left in place uh, that we, we drill through and use uh, from that standpoint. Here you see several rigs uh, on site that are drilling quite heavily in this area and some could be larger rigs than other rigs um, knowing the the layouts of each one of these rigs could be different so it could be a workover rig which means they're coming back to maybe clean out a hole or, or do some uh, additional work to it uh, this could be one where it's a new wheel new well uh, drill and so you have lots of new tanks and new stuff that has to be over so the different types of uh, activities of drilling all that information it could be uh, captured uh, this is just showing some of the rigs out in the location you can see the pad if you will uh, size that they have for that rig and it's a lot of it storing equipment and information that could be temporarily and then move to a smaller footprint later on. Uh, some of the completion equipment here, uh, here you can see a sand truck so when they're doing fracking they're mixing in the propent that they're going to mix with the fluid out of the fluid tanks and push that down in the hole so you have the sand and this uh, fluid tank so all that fluid database is, is information how much where did it come from all those things can be kept into your database all the information about the trucks here in and out the facility is very important now we have uh, the wellhead if you will coming up and sh there it has a pipe going back into the ground could be going over to tanks or separation because we have water uh, in there uh, and it could need to be separated from the water or the uh, condensate all right and so here we have uh, could be a voltage system right here and that could be going into the fact that there is not an artificial lift system of a pump going up and down it could have an emerged uh, uh, pump system EPS uh, or e ESP uh, and it's at the bottom and it's like a sump pump at the very bottom and it's actually pushing up to the top so it has to have some power down there now when it gets up there it's got a lot of water and oil or condensate mixed together and you want to separate the oil and the water so there are these 
well uh, separator system. So there's serial numbers, there's all this information about these facilities when they're last serviced, who has done that. Uh, that might be kept in a separate database but could be tied to the GIS. Uh, so if you have going back to all those facilities all those wells there's a lot of different things glycol impumption again separating injecting glycol dehydrator glycol separation more uh, boiler uh, separation system line heat heat the line to try to separate the water here's a control pneumatic glycol pump heat trace pump uh, here's a system that's got a dehydrator and doing some separation and heating over here so you get that portion. So what do you do when you separate it? Well you put the oil in one tank and water in another tank for them to come by and, and to drain both the uh, oil into the water. Uh, sometimes you put oil into a pipeline but typically you're hauling that so you have a haul system for the oil and a and the uh, water and the natural gas goes into a gathering line. Uh, a lot of problems with theft and uh, it was like 60 million dollars I think in Texas in 2013 of theft from oil. Vacuum trucks come by and where they should be taking the water they might be taking oil. So here's the truck loadout where a vacuum truck might come in connect to uh, a storage tank and, and, and try to take that out. And by the way, I've been working on a thing to drop an isotope in here as a tracer. Each company would have a isotope tracer that we could put in there. So you shouldn't be into the oil tank. And once we've tainted an oil tank, vacuum trucks that only vacuum water should only get water. Now we need to know at the point of sales for the natural gas specifically and somewhat the oil. We need to count exactly from that location because we might be gathered into lines where a lot of lines come together. So we have to count the amount of natural gas that is sold off that pad at that location. And so the, ga the gas sales or the point of sales is, is here and we have a telemetry system. We send in that back so we have a solar, solar power and a radio broadcasting what is that is so as the natural gas is coming uh, out and away and towards the gathering system we count that and that's what we use to pay upon so multiple wells and maybe you're going in different uh, formations you might be going in different directions or different lands if you have a pad and you're drilling and four different ways it could be different mineral owners so you have to keep up with that so you have multiple well facilities that you have to either keep up with cells and, and different information so you have a lot of these pieces of equipment all located pipelines you could come in and do a lot of 3d scanning and keeping up with it but you could build a database that has all that information so we move from all the stuff that came in from the well link to the stuff that's there permanently for that aspect and all the tanks uh, serial numbers when were they ordered uh, when are they serviced all the pipes and information a lot of information here that could be easily captured uh, with using maybe the handheld app uh, survey one two three or those to put in there we we've, we've done that before solar power stations you know some of this is sending real-time information the point of sales data goes into a database you could actually link that into the GIS from the facility from that standpoint some of this is is built um, very similar from location to location the well battery tanks uh, as you see here when they design these these are pretty standard tanks that might be in their shop locations and this is where BIM and GIS are really merging BIM building information modeling this is taking all that information we know and in, in, in facility engineering is is very well tuned for BIM because there are pretty standard tanks and sets of information and that set of standard information could be connected quickly to the GIS and then simply modeled by using standard layouts and facilities uh, from that standpoint here I'll show one I've got one for the lab and, and, and you can see here where we designed the wells and I've got the layout uh, of the rig and tanks and information temporarily but when I go to put the facilities and tanks and everything there these are standards standard design 
drawings in CAD that come from the engineering companies uh, that, that are pretty quickly moved from well pad to well pad, reproducing everything, it would be good to tie those all into the GIS very quickly from that standpoint. So we get through, we have uh, reclaiming, going back, what used to be there is important as you know we try to revegetate the area and see what's there we'd have an imprint of what wells set where uh, what tanks set where where separators were where any lines ran so when we look at any area that could not have the growth back that we want uh, of vegetation we might need to remediate the soil from that standpoint and here we can see good growth back from that area other things that they have is such as hiding information, uh, hiding the facilities by camouflage, uh, putting sound barriers around it, uh, trees and things of that nature. And then we have the gathering station. So all these gas lines are coming to a central location where they are compressed. Uh, they are again separated from some of the other types of fuels like the uh, um, different uh, uh, um, con con uh, concentrates um, could be extracted and compressed and here they're showing some compression statement stations this is a 33,000 horsepower compression so they're compressing all these gases together putting them in what's called a main trunk line and shipping it down to Denver shipping it to Salt Lake shipping it to San Francisco big cities that need uh, natural gas to fuel the consumer what do they do with the water? Uh, so now we have all this water. Uh, what do we do with it? There's uh, in-ground injection. Uh, uh, there's some uh, actually aerating it, uh, disposing it across the land, recycling it, reusing it, different ways to do it. Uh, here's just another facility that's that's taking and processing the water, storing uh, barrels of water and oil, processing it and then uh, taking uh, uh, the liquid and, and either uh, shipping the liquid uh, once they've maybe gathered all the liquid together you, you put the crude into a pipeline and send it down there so they monitor the environment uh, so you can see the environmental stations and kind of see if what you know is occurring around the state and has some good information so that was a good overview of the equipment you know going into the drilling the equipment left behind uh, from that to summarize you're going to see again a lot of the equipment uh, used for drilling and then tanks separators well heads point of sales a very standard set of packages now here's a good one from uh, Chesapeake about the Marquette Cellus shell uh, work up in Ohio and uh, looking at the unconventional, looking again, they're going into tight gas, very small uh, horizons or uh, um, stratus that has gas, natural gas into it and trying to get to that. So shell is a organic rich sedimentary rock or shell that have originally deposited mud within the tidal flats and deep water basins. And these shells have low permeability typically required a combination of horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing for grass to be released in an economic quantity so they go in here and they're full of gas they're full of natural gas that that will 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 burn uh, and, and, and able to to get it so here shows uh, the Marcellus uh, shell area and a lot of the other ones here we can see the Barnet uh, shell area, the Haynesville shell area, the Fett shell area. You can see the different ones uh, around uh, um, the United States that we know has uh, areas. And then you can see uh, in there uh, the tons uh, per cubic feet of natural gas, so which has a very rich amount of natural gas that are in these these areas all right here's a, a more detailed map of it showing some in that area uh, you can see the uh, different uh, areas and in, in showing where a lot of the rig work is here we're down into the Eagleford the South Texas area uh, now is the big one is is into the Permian Basin 
and then deeper holdings into the wolf camp now. So let's look at the process. First, you got to select a site. You got to do a well uh, design. You got to drill the well. You got to complete the well, and you got to market the gas, sell it, and then you got to reclaim the site. So site selection, number of factors are considered for the drilling site. Favor of geology. Uh, we're going to have high plays, uh, very thick in that area. And there's been a lot of work and, and a lot of money wasted in this area about a lot of companies thinking that there was something there, but it's not a very liquid, uh, wet gas, very dry gas that doesn't pay off as much. And then, you know, so you want to get the areas that have the most amount of return so it pays for the well. The topography, where are you drilling? I mean, you're drilling in really rough terrain, high, a lot of earth movement uh, in swamps. You know, how, how are the roads? Can you get over bridges? Can you get to these locations without having to build a lot? And then the routes for pipelines and utilities, uh, the proximity to schools, residential areas, all those considerations. The wells uh, located in rural and urban areas, try to avoid as many uh, um, areas, but one to three acres to construct and get up to five. Again, some really big one, 10 acres uh, out west when you have, you know, six, seven type wells on top of each other. So you have all these well locations and a series of roads that get to them. A lot of them are vertical wells, all right, that, that you get up there and so you look at how much are you going to actually be disturbing in these 640s area so you know 40 40 40 you can see the sections and the quarter sections and the quarter quarter from that standpoint where if we have a lot of horizontal wells we don't have to disturb as much we can put a series here and do several different kickouts and frack stations horizontally through those so the horizontal drilling has limited or, or reduced the amount of uh, uh, impact that we have on the earth. So the horizontal drilling aspect uh, does take a bigger footprint on the ground initially because there's a lot of facilities that need to be made to do that. We talked about that earlier. And as we go down through the earth, we have to case in. So we got to bring in concrete trucks. We got to bring in like special pipes to make sure that we are definitely not infringing on our drinking water area. And a lot of people say, oh, that it's damaging that. Well, we're usually 8,000 feet. There's no drinking water here. The, the question could be if you have any failures in the casings where you have, you know, typically pipe, or concrete pipe, concrete pipe, concrete pipe, concrete pipe. Can natural gas seep up from here along this way and get into that? Yes, it can. So that, that's a big concern that, that we have. So groundwater protections, uh, how they try to go through and, and protect it, talks about that there. Now drilling the wells, uh, when you have got the facility, you're gonna go down through and we're drilling the wells having a number of frack stations from here. Here you can see a facility again. You have the drilling rig that's here, all right? Uh, you see pipes being stacked over here, some control stations, uh, uh, trailers, people who are working from there, uh, sleeping on site, because you have a 12 on, 12 off type operation. So you need to have, you know, sleeping quarters and locations for them to stay. The different trucks, some of the fluids could be there. Uh, you know, we have some of our, our flare boxes and maybe blow out prevention valves, different pipes that we need uh, from that area, okay? We have sound protection. Uh, we try to limit those and put things up from that standpoint. Drilling lighting, uh, this has a big impact on some environmental concerns. Then we go to complete a well, now we're taking and we're taking a lot of fluid trucks and we're pumping a lot of fluid and maybe mixing them with sand or propent to fill in the cracks of that area. So fracking is the process to stimulate natural gas from the shell. Water is mixed with propents, typically sand uh, or borax and pumped into the shell reserve under high pressure. This process of fracking, the shell releases the gas in several days to complete 
only conducted during the daylight hours. So we have a lot of equipment, a lot of things being held in that portion. So you have the water, you have the the frac fluids and maybe the gel and prospects that are all mixed together, put together, pushed down through the wellhead, all the way out through the the to the ground. And then you have the back pressure of that coming back up and then being captured. So we have a lot of facilities here. We have a data monitoring band looking at all the water being captured, all the uh, mixing uh, data coming back, the slurry from the gel, any chemicals, blending, where our sands, all these have to harmoniously work together to push the fluid down there. there. So as you frack the fluids uh, that are go down there, you know, what are in the fluids? Well, the fluids are mainly water, you know, 85% by weight, but then you have the sand and then the lubricants. And the biggest portion of the lubricants is pretty much the stuff in chapstick or lipstick. It is a petroleum paste product to, to make the sand be able to, to slip into the locations. A lot of water is used, the water is recycled, it sometimes takes a number of years to get all the water out of the wells over a period of time and we look at the total amount of water that's being used in a lot of areas and in, in you know how it's being used for mining versus public use versus power. It's not a huge amount but it is some of the water that's being used. So gas and drilling consumption of water uh, is, is, is a concern. It is, it is measurable and, and it should be monitored. All right. So if we look again through the uh, breakdown of what's in there, uh, you know, uh, from that aspect, a lot of it, the surfactant, a lot of these things are mainly the lubricants uh, uh, that's coming in uh, to that portion of the overall being the water element uh, from that aspect uh, of, of what's being pumped into that hole. Now when the water starts to come back up it's either got the weight of the earth pulling it or you know sometimes you have to artificially pull it back up uh, and then you have the back pressure and so flow back water consists of the initial water that is returned to the surface after hydraulic fracturing consists of the frac makeup of the water combined with natural forming water uh, that is down there along with any oil and gas. Flow back water is piped steel frac tanks in site and transportation off site for disposal. So here you can see again are these flow back tanks uh, that are coming back up. Uh, they collect them in there. They have overspill. I mean, if they are bringing too much, they should shut off. They have information to know, oh, I'm getting too much water in there. They have berms surrounded to make sure any overspill is all captured and stays on site from that standpoint. So when you're flowing water back or flowing fluids back, the well is considered completed and now it's connected to a point of cells and the wellhead is bringing it up it's either manually or you know it's it's artificially lifted up and then it's separated and you separate typically the gas will go to a meter uh, water will go over here and take and if you do have any oil will go into the oil tank from that standpoint uh, once you're finished you're going to come back and bring it back make it look like normal earth do a portion uh, they talk about the uh, workforce but the compression station so you have all these pipelines that are gathering all this data up and then you push all that data to a location and natural gas is one of the purest or cleanest forms of hydrocarbons that we have it has a lot of value in terms of what it can do compared to burning a crude oil and uh, we could see it powering a lot more of our vehicles uh, cars, trucks, buses, uh, farm equipment, you know, and using obviously for heating is probably the number one heating source that we use in the United States to uh, keep your house heated. Okay, well that was a summary of the equipment and information of facilities for oil and gas um, 
in a GIS.